All right, so we'll start over. Well, start. This is the 245 session of targeting races, recruiting candidates, strategies, and viability with Lynn Serpy and Lori Major. So thank you all. Um, I wasn't here at the morning session. I was at a big event called Going Green in Queens out in Flushing. So I'm not familiar with a lot of you in the room, which is actually always a wonderful thing for there to be new people involved and new, new faces and new questions, etc. So I'm just going to ask a few questions. Um, how many of you are from New York City? OK. And how many of you are from New Jersey? Is anyone here from Connecticut? How about Pennsylvania? Long Island? Upstate New York, defined as anything north of New York City? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's great. That's helpful. Then the next question is, does anyone in this room hold public office? OK. Has anyone in this room run for public office? OK, great. Does anyone in this room hold elected office for another organization, like a union or a school, um, parent, teacher council, a community garden? Right. Oh, I see a couple of hands. Right. Right. Oh, you got elected to the board? Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was a neighborhood associate. Okay. Right, great. And then how about is anyone here appointed to some sort of public position, maybe a community board or some sort of committee of their city state government? Okay. So that gives me a little sense of where you guys are at. The last question is, are any of you planning on running for office sometime in the near future, i.e. this year or next year? <laughs> okay, great. So, did you have any questions for our audience? No. Okay. <laughs> like I said, I just kind of want to get a sense of where people are coming from so that hopefully what we talk about are going to be relevant. Gloria and I are going to talk a little bit up front, then open it up for discussion, Q&A, etc. So, just real quickly, my name is Lynn Serpy. I got active with the Green Party in 1994, with the Green Party in New Mexico. I have lived and worked all over the country and actually all over the world. I was fortunate enough to spend two years working for the New Zealand Parliament, for the Green Party members of Parliament. I've worked on proportional representation, voting system reform, referenda campaigns in British Columbia, in Ontario. I've worked on green, global green conferences in Australia, Brazil. And then I myself have run for office. I worked on one of Gloria's campaigns. And in 2004, as I think was mentioned somewhere, I did run the 2004 Green Party presidential campaign and the resulting Ohio recount. So I have a lot of experience doing candidate campaigns as well as referenda campaigns. The referenda campaigns are primarily on voting system reform. I don't know if Gloria needs introduction. Uh, well, I, was, I introduced myself early this morning, but just for people who may not have been here, uh, I'm Gloria Matera. Currently, I'm co-chair of the Green Party of New York State uh, and chair of the county party in Brooklyn. Uh, I have run for office several times. Uh, mostly for local office, and more recently, a couple of years ago, for lieutenant governor. Um, I've participated as, mostly as a volunteer campaign worker in other people's campaigns, um, and been active in the party uh, since 2000 in the Nader campaign. All right, so I like to tell a story, and the good news is I don't think anyone in this room has heard it, which is awesome. Okay, so once upon a time in 1999, I was in California. And the Green Party of Alameda County, which is in Berkeley, um, Oakland, and other parts of the county, there was going to be a special election. And the Green Party there had done some analysis, and they were like, oh gosh, this special election provides us with enormous opportunities. Because there wasn't going to be a primary system. It was going to be that if any candidate got over 50%, they got elected. But if no one got over 50%, then each party would advance the top vote winner. So three Democrats had said they were going to run for the seat. The Greens looked at the numbers, and they didn't think that, those Demo that any Democrat was going to be able to get 50%. They were certain that the votes were going to be split. So they said, gosh, if we run a Green Party candidate, they'll force a runoff between the Green and the Democrat. So they'll guarantee us you know, a two-way race, Green and a Democrat. So that was 
they had done some analysis of the local situation and they said, we want to run in this race because it provides us an opportunity. So then they had to go and look for a candidate to run in that race. And they ended up with a woman named Audie Bach who had joined the party in around 1996. She didn't have a huge history of involvement in the community. She didn't even have a huge history of involvement in, in the party. But she had one of the most essential criteria in that she was willing to run. <laughs> and fortunately, she was also an articulate speaker and you know, was able to present well and things like that. But on the story, the idea was that the Greens deliberately looked for someone to run for that race. Because in their analysis, that race offered an opportunity that they didn't always get. Then they went out and they looked for a candidate. And then they said, OK, you know what? We actually might be able to win this race. Or I guess I said that. Because I looked at the numbers. And I know there's a different workshop on numbers, but I'm just going to briefly run them over because they always get me excited. So in Alameda County at the time, was roughly 250,000 registered voters, roughly. In that first round race, about 100,000 people had turned out to vote. In the runoff, runoffs usually have a lower voter turnout, so we calculated that maybe 75,000 people would vote. And in a two-way race, that means you need about 37,500 and one votes to win. So in the targeting perspective, you go from a universe of 250,000 voters to you're looking at 37,000. So Greens generally tend to have limited resources, time, money, effort, whatever it might be. So the idea was, who are these 37,500 voters that we want to get? We raised what for us at the time was a lot of money, it was 30000 We were in a situation where at the time no Green Party candidate had been ever elected to a state office and that the bulk of the Greens elected at the national level were elected to nonpartisan offices. This was a partisan office, it was a state legislative seat. Audie was running against the former person who would hold that seat, Elihu Harris, any state building in Oakland was named after him. So it was a big challenge. However, he took it all for granted and so we didn't. We were hungry, we had to analyze the numbers, and we said, okay, we're gonna target these 70,000 people out of your universe, and we're looking for 37,501 votes. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but we got something like 37,483 votes, and we won. We toppled the former incumbent, who the state building was named after, we got a green elected to the state legislature for the first time ever. And I became a huge fan of targeting, both the voters you talk to, as well as targeting the races that you run in. Because I am a big believer that being green, a lot of times, is about using resources wisely. And this one I know Gloria's heard me say. Whether that is our time, or our money, or of course our natural resources. So that's the big exciting story, which is supposed to get you all pumped up. Um, did it work? Yeah. <laughs> Yay! Okay, so that's the, the story there. One of the things we did is, of course, you crunch the numbers and you look at voter registration lists. You're, and that information gives you a lot of their name, the date they registered to vote, maybe the last date they voted, their gender, their birth date. There's a lot of information there. It also gives you their geographic location. So you can say, well, we want to target voters who live in this neighborhood or voters who live in that neighborhood. We want to target women or we want to target men or we want to target 21 to 30 year olds or we want to target over 65. So we put together a plan that was like, our particular candidate wanted to talk a lot about health care. So we wanted to maybe, if we were talking about health care to a senior, it's different than maybe how you would talk to health care for someone in college. And the wonderful thing about targeting is that you can do that. You're not changing your message like wishy-washy, what's going to pull well, is that you're trying to figure out how to start a dialogue with the person you want to talk to. Because that's the most important thing. Like we, we think we have a lot of the answers, and I think we have a lot of the answers, but you have to think about the person, you want them to do something for you. You want them to vote for you or your candidate. So you have to get a sense of where they're coming from and what they care about. So the example we used to use in New Zealand is when you talk to a college student, you might lead, as we did in New Zealand, with talking about decriminalization of marijuana, not necessarily about superannuation, which is the pension plan. <laughs> no, it's just that simple. Now, sooner or later, you might get around to it, because if you're talking about the pension plan, you're talking about where you're investing your money and corporate control and all these other issues. But if you start out talking about superannuation and pensions to an 18-year-old, you're just not going to go anywhere. So that's just a little bit when you're targeting. I don't want to go too much on that, because like I said, I know there is another workshop on that. So the title was Recruiting Candidates Targeting Races to Run. So I gave you this example. For me, in the future then, I've always sat and said, okay, what kind of races do we want to run in? What are the criteria that we want to look at to decide that a race is 
worth our limited time and our limited resources. So for me, I like to first see if there's a race that is potentially winnable. Why not? If not, I like to see if there's a race, and this is my personal opinion, there is a race that is potentially spoilable. Yeah. And by that, I'm a big fan of instant runoff voting or ranked choice voting or preferential voting where you rank your candidates in order of preference one, two, three, your first choice, your second choice, your third choice. This is a system that's used all over the world and actually used all over the United States um, at various levels. And it avoids that so-called spoiler dynamic where you, know, you worry that if you vote for one candidate, another candidate might get elected. But this solution has been in existence for years, and those in power don't choose to pass that legislation. In New Mexico, in 1997, a Green Party candidate named Carol Miller had gotten 17%, and all of a sudden, IRV legislation in New Mexico got further in the state legislature than it ever had before, because the Democrats there realized, oh gosh, we might continue to get spoiled, we need to change the system. So I personally happen to like the idea of something that was coined as a phrase, spoiling for success. I know a lot of people don't like it, and that's certainly something that people can discuss, and there's ramifications the local level versus the state level versus the national level. But if, when I'm looking at a race to run in, and I'm thinking, for me, the issue is how are we going to be relevant? Like, relevance is a big issue. So winnable, that would make us relevant. Spoilable, that would make us relevant. Could be that we're looking to set ourselves up for a future run. So some of you are here in New York City. There's city council, mayoral, public advocate elections this year. Next year, there's state legislative elections. Currently in New York City, we have a matching funds public financing program for the local level. We don't have that in the state, <coughs> although that may change. A lot of times, Greens think, well, the state races, we can't raise the money to compete on a level playing field. Well, you could say, well, let's run in a similar district for city council, raise the matching funds, raise your profile, raise the money, and then turn that into a stronger run a few months later. So that could be another example of why you might target a certain race to run. There could be a critical issue in your district. I mean, certainly when Gloria ran for borough president, that was a really big one. Um, there could also be some other opportunity. Maybe it is that there's matching funds. Or maybe it's that you've been in a state that hasn't had ballot access for years and years and years and years, and all of a sudden, you do. And running for office doesn't require gathering three, 4,000 signatures. It requires gathering 5% of the registered voters in your district, for example. The other one are special elections. So special elections offer a really great opportunity. Because usually most of the normal rules of an election are just kind of tossed out the window because you have a much shorter time frame. They may or may not have partisan primaries. They may or may not allow people to run with partisan labels, whatever it might be. The other candidates haven't had you know, one, two, three years to be raising money. And so it's a little bit of a free for all. I love special elections. And I see them as an enormous opportunity for us. So for me, those are some of the things I look at in identifying races to run. So for each of them, though, how do you know if it's potentially winnable, spoilable, all that kind of stuff? That's the running the numbers, which as much as I like to talk about is a different workshop topic today. <laughs> um, so I want to, you know, so, yes, it's yeah. going on now. But we can allow them to bore people up with specific questions yeah, right. about that. Yeah, so, so what's going on now. Right, right. Oh, okay, <laughs> got it. Good point. So, so, um, so that's a big thing for me. The other one is looking at the size of the race. In New York City, city council races are smallest unit of elected office. It's a big district with a lot of voters. That's not the case in other cities. And some of you are from other places where the districts might be a little smaller. There's also around the country and around um, even the East Coast, you have races like for soil and health district or water board, or there's dozens of people who've been elected in Pennsylvania, I think for board of trustees. And so sometimes you wanna look at maybe there are some of these races that are smaller and so with our limited resources, we can have more impact. We can be more relevant. Uh, a lot of times, people get excited about the Green Party and they want to run for Congress. And that's great. Rarely are they winnable. Um, rarely, just because of gerrymandering and a whole range of voting system issues, are they even spoilable. Um, and pretty much the idea of setting up for the future a bigger run, Congress to President, you know, it's always certainly a way forward, but then, but critical issues. That's really the reason why a lot of Greens run for Congress, because they're excited about a certain national issue. For me, though, unless they're going to be relevant in some way, 
it's not actually a race that I would recommend targeting. So I want to stop talking so Gloria can toss in her thoughts. Thank you. Lynn? I think it's really helpful um, when Lynn gives us this kind of perspective and also kind of how it really happened um, in Alameda County way back in 99. Um, because, because I think it, it's, it's basically been spotty in different areas of the country for the Green Party and how they're, how they're looking at that. Um, and yes, we're in New York, and we're, most of us are in New York City, and there's some special things about that when Lynn talks about matching funds. That already is kind of a check off um, for considering that because we know that having um, a reasonable amount of financial support, uh, it's not true that campaign finance program levels the playing field, no way. Uh, but it basically gives you an opportunity to have financial support. Um, that, that that really makes a difference in terms of some of the other things Lynn talked about, you know, visibility. And, uh, and I guess what I'm, what I'm hoping will happen in the discussion too is that we're just kind of beginning to put these two pieces together. One, uh, I think not as consistently and as thoroughly around, around the target areas that, and strategies Lynn is talking about. I, I mean, other people have that experience. It'd be great to hear about it later. For, for some of us, it's kind of, we're just getting comfortable with it and getting to know how to do it. Uh, but we have really been making, I think, some inroads into you know, candidate recruitment. Um, I'm going to say now, even though I'm going to talk about it a little bit, they're actually not, shouldn't really be uh, as they are right now, which is kind of parallel, uh, not taking the other into consideration. Um, and we have done some work in New York City. People can see a few more of these. Karen Young, who's in the back and was one of the organizers of this um, event today, really put a lot of effort into designing a brochure um, where we can kind of put out there and show people how they could be a candidate. Uh, and some successful candidates, I think Lynn is in here, in fact, um, that we've had in terms of just stepping up. Then not, we, we, I think we may have Jason. No, no, no. no, no. Um, but I, I do think it's important to think carefully about who your candidate or your candidate pool can be. Uh, I think this came up in a previous workshop, and Lynn said it also. I think Jill said it earlier, and Lynn said it, which is, you know, one of their top qualities is they are willing to run because that's not an easy thing to do. Um, so you want to get a pool of people who feel like this is something they can actually take on. Um, I think to recruit candidates in areas where we don't have this kind of information, it's time for us to stop doing, I guess. I think that we've become a much more present and stronger um, an energetic force as a national party. I think a lot of that is our last national campaign. I think a lot of it is some of the kind of situation of the world that's happening and people kind of really turning around and saying, I don't want to vote for these people. I don't want to vote for this part, these parties anymore. Um, so I think to just kind of look, and Lynn and I have talked about this, and just say, we should recruit this kind of candidate. Like, we need more women. We need more candidates of color. Uh, we need younger candidates does make sense. But somehow, if it doesn't fit in the area where they're living uh, or where they can run, then we have a little bit of a disconnect. Unless we just basically say the target for this is focusing on that constituency, building a party, which we talked about earlier, through that type of candidate, through a young person who's going to be campaigning and connecting with young people in the community and the, you know, the college voters that we have. Um, otherwise, it becomes, you know, it leaves that candidate kind of on their own. Um, and also being kind of a, a candidate with a label, even though we're not doing it, I think, in a negative way. Um, and I have often been someone in the party who'll say, well, we have, you know, there are four, you know, four white guys with gray, gray in their hair wearing suits running for governor. Why do we want another one to do that? Um, but when you look at New York, in New York, our, our past governor's candidate, he kind of fit that profile, but everything he had to say. Uh, was what was important to say. You know, Howie Hawkins really talked about what the party and you know what the party can do and what a green governor can do in New York State, right? 
But it's, it, I think in the beginning, when we were looking at governor's candidates, just as a real concrete example, we were trying to think outside of the other, can, the other party's candidates in terms of the face of the, of the party, the face of who that candidate was the spokesperson. And we talked earlier that most of the time, our campaigns, it's using the word our and we. It's not about the personality, that that candidate is a spokesperson. And so, um, you know, what I, I'm really hoping is a con beginning conversation today is how do we put those things together? But how do we, as a party, educate ourselves and get the kind of workforce in our party to do that kind of targeting um, in an area? Um, and that, I think, really starts on the local level. Um, but one thing that came up in, a, in the workshop earlier, um, if a younger person, a, a first-time candidate wants to run, they don't come necessarily with a team. They don't come with a, the party infrastructure if they're not active in their local. Um, but they have lots of other qualities uh, that are really important to be a Green Party candidate. You know, should the party be saying, we're, we're going to be your team. You know, we think, we think the idea that you want to run is great. We will be your team, and we will put the party resources into that. And I think we can't put party resources into particular races unless we look at these this criteria, you know, that Lynn's outlined for us. Otherwise, it's not really, um, as you would say, using our resources wisely. It might be looking get, getting behind a great candidate for who they are and what they can talk about and how they, what they represent. But if the other criteria doesn't work. Um, then you know, what's actually the goal of that and what kind of effort we put into it. So to just give it context, what I'm talking about is when we are proactively thinking what kind of races do we want to run in. This does not mean that if someone wants to run for other reasons that it's not valid. But we are talking about recruiting candidates specifically. And so I'm saying I want us to think critically and analyze which races we're going to use our limited resources in. So for me, and one of the things I didn't mention in my overview is, beside, is that I did spend years running campaigns. I've probably run, I don't know, 30 or 40 campaigns. And I've actually won some, which is always exciting, <laughs> besides the one I mentioned in 1999. And so when I, I often will sit down with candidates who come to me because they would like to hire me. And I assess a few things about them. I like candidates who can articulate the green message. I like candidates who are realistic in their goals, realistic in recognition of what our resources are. The idea of maybe they're not bringing an enormous amount of volunteers doesn't actually mean that the party is going to be able to bring an enormous amount of volunteers. I want them to be realistic. A third criteria for me, they got to be willing to fundraise. You hear me, Karen? they got to be willing to fundraise. All right. <laughs> I, I know that's something that Karen cares about a lot. Um, it's also really helpful if beyond the fact that they are the Green Party candidate, that there is a reason for the voter to vote for them. As I mentioned, we are asking something from the voter. We are asking them to buy our brand, buy our candidate via a vote. So it's helpful if they've had some sort of experience in the community, either on a certain issue, or perhaps their job is such that it provides them a level of expertise on an important issue, whatever it might be. And then the final one, though, is that they don't have to be an expert on every single issue, but they do need that willingness to listen to those people who are. So those are some of like the big core criteria when I'm looking at a candidate coming to me saying, I want you to run my campaign, is that if they're not fairly articulate, if I don't think they have a grasp on reality, if they're not willing to fundraise, if they don't have a reason for me to vote for them outside the fact that they're a Green Party member, and if they're not willing to listen to people who do know more than them on a given issue, then that's not a candidate that I personally want to spend you know, 6, 8, 10, 12, 16 weeks 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, working on their campaign. I'm feeling really good now that like, I know. my campaign manager. There you go. So, you know, Gloria, <laughs> Gloria made the cut, you know. <laughs> um, but all that said, the other thing is I, I touched on it briefly about goals. And I'm just trying to make sure I, everything that I thought about in advance, I want to make sure I talk about it. Because at some point I thought it was important to say. So I mentioned that people have different goals. It might be the percentage of the vote to receive. It might be to build a Green Party, and I know that was talked about earlier today. It might be to raise a certain amount of money to build a donor database. It might be to have a certain number of volunteers. I mean, there's a whole range of goals. All these things are interrelated. A lot of times we do look at them in isolation, but the reality is that all this stuff is interrelated. The, um, and oh, I forgot the note I didn't mention. Willing to get up to speed on issues that the voters care about, not just about your own pet topic. 
That's a really important one. The other one I always say to candidates is I'll give you like four issues for you to focus on. You get a gimme. There's one issue that you care about that the voters may or may not care about in your district, but you're just so darn passionate about that I have to let you talk about it or else you, know, you won't be happy. But the other issues have to be issues that voters care about. Um, and that's a biggie because, so again, a lot of times Greens go in because they want to talk about a certain issue. And it may be a great issue. It just may not be what voters want to hear. When I ran in 2009, I wanted to talk about proportional representation and instant runoff voting and single chance verbal vote. And I did a little bit, not as much as I would have liked. But the reality is that it wasn't in that year, that wasn't the time to talk about it. This year it might be, which is why I'm still trying to decide if I'll run. Um, on any given day, my opinion varies. Some days I'm leaning towards it. Some days I remember how much work it is. And I'm not actually sure. But the other sort of helpful things in a candidate, just and these are just really practical things. It is always helpful if a candidate speaks another language, especially the one that is prevalent in their district. It's not a requirement, but it's certainly helpful. It is helpful if um, there is a point of differentiation between them and the other candidates. And I mention that in particular because a lot of times people might run in a district where it's the leading other candidate is a progressive Democrat. And so what they hear a lot is, well, why are you running against this person? You know, so it's helpful if there is some point of differentiation. It could be your experience, your background issue you worked on. It could be um, a whole range of things. But it is always helpful to be able to say, this is how I'm different. And not to say, well, I'm different because I'm a green. I mean, yes, it's a point of differentiation. I'm saying it's helpful to have something more than that. Although at core, the fact that you're a green is a massive point of differentiation because for many of us, the two-party system itself is the problem. But, um, you know, I wanted to, I made another note, which is another story. In 2004, I ran the, ran the Green Party presidential campaign and afterwards there was a debriefing process with the National Committee, National Steering Committee, whatever the thing is called. And I remember, I can't remember if I put this in writing or I made a joke. But people said, well, what would you recommend when we're trying to recruit candidates or think about presidential candidates for the future? And based on some of my experiences, very, I, had, <laughs> I had three criteria. I said, pick a candidate whose name has five or fewer letters, because when you do, because when you do a yard sign, you know, you want the name, you don't want a really long name. I was like, second, pick a candidate who lives on the East Coast. And the reason for that is time zone differences. If you want the New York Times or the Washington Post or ABC, NBC, if you want to be, you have to be on that news cycle. And that means you have to be on the East Coast. It's great to live like, off of the mountains in the woods, up a hill through a stream, you know, in Northern California, but it's not necessarily that great when you're trying to make sure that you get inserted into the news cycle. And the third was, and this, and this was just my personal preference, I said it would be great if we had a woman. Flash forward 2012, Jill S. T E I N, who lives in Massachusetts and is a woman. So I don't necessarily think it's because anyone took me seriously, because I vaguely remember saying, well, if you really want my recommendations, you know, and I made it as a joke, and then I said, you know, I'm only half kidding, and everyone laughed, and I was like, no, really, I'm only half kidding. But it is sort of funny to me that, sure enough, 12 years later, that's what we get, and look how well she did. No. <laughs> Um, I'm going to stop talking again, Gloria. No? Otherwise, uh, we'll let them talk. Yeah. Well, I guess I, I'd like to hear a little bit from people because, and then, and then it might be easier to just kind of save a little time at the end to kind of pull it all together. Sounds that good. Makes yeah. sense to you. If, if right. people kind of have stories, questions, debate what Lynn and I have said, don't agree, um, have other ideas, we'd really like to hear that. And I sometimes say statements in a very blunt way just because I like to get the reaction. <laughs> Sir? I just wanted to know uh, what was the vote count for Jill Stein's uh, The which count? Jill Stein's vote count. Jill, Jill would be well, able to answer Jill's that. Jill's right behind you. Right? Yeah. I'm sorry. That's okay. I don't want to give the wrong number. So we wound up getting a little bit under half a million votes that we know of that were counted and reported. Right? Um, but it's, you know, it's just about three times number of votes that we got in the last election, which had its own set of, of uh, <coughs> repressive and obstructive things going on. Um, one way to put that result in context is to look at the next biggest vote getter that was not corporate sponsored, you know, because the whole system is set up to propagate corporate candidates. So we actually received uh, 10 times the number of votes as the next biggest progressive vote getter who 
who might have been, I don't recall whether it was a socialist candidate or Peace and Freedom or Rocky Anderson, but they were all kind of in there together, but we were way out in front. So it, it goes along with what many of us have been hearing in these workshops, which is that there's more than one objective in a campaign. Part of it is getting votes, but remember, an election that is rigged from the get-go, from the money, from the silencing, from the, you know, keeping you off the ballot, you don't want to just, you know, look at votes. Votes are important, but what's happening out in the street and just the momentum of the party is really important. And in that way, we feel like it was just an incredible victory that uh, continues to roll out for all of us. And, you know, in some areas, and I hope New York City is, is one of them, where we're really looking carefully if races are viable um, and that, you know, why we're targeting them, then in some ways that is a party responsibility. It's not, it shouldn't be an assumption because someone says, you know, I, I, I say I'm in the Park Slope Local, I think I'll run for city council, and then everything kind of just, be, that local became my team or became my campaign. I was really fortunate because my local was an integral part of my campaign, but that was because it was a conversation. They were involved in looking at it. We may not, I don't think we did the kind of targeting in detail the way Lynn has, has talked to us about. Um, so I would think that if there's some kind of guidelines and vetting process, like, you know, what, what does this candidate bring in, in the district that this candidate is in, I, I think actually the local should, the Green Party activists should, at least some of them, form some kind of nucleus, whether it's to be the volunteers, whether it's to be the launching pad for this candidate um, and help them find other people to run. And so I, the way you describe it, Daniel, obviously it sounds like it was assumptions on both parts with no clear criteria about it. I don't know, Lynn, if you... So I, I've worked on a bunch of campaigns or with a bunch of different locals who often think, oh, we have to go recruit a candidate with name recognition or star power. And I think the reason is because they, there's this recognition that perhaps we might have limited resources. So there's this hope that this person is going to bring in resources. And rarely does that happen, which is why my second criteria of good candidates is that they have to be realistic. And that comes directly from my experiences with those things where we have approached candidates who maybe don't have the history with the party or even a history with social movements but you know, we got excited because they had this name recognition. So that's not the scenario you're talking about, but it has some similarities, which is, first of all, if someone wants to run and they want to do the work, great, and we should support them as much as we can given our limited resources. But yes, you need to have a conversation what that means realistically. So I know there's been candidates here in New York who we recruited who have some level of name recognition, and I know there's been candidates in other parts of this, the country, and that conversation, about the realistic resources, it has to happen early, early on, before the filing, just before that person even puts their name out there. Because what ha ends up happening, or has happened again and again and again, is the people will run, and then they don't get the resources that they expected, and then all these resentments happen. And then the post-election period, which is often one of the most crucial areas, 
is rife with resentment, anger, and it goes nowhere. So now you've had all these people who've devoted their time, energy, effort, money, whatever, for months on end, the election day is over, this candidate that we recruited in this scenario, they walk away. So one is that we have to think about you know, how do we, we retain our candidates as well as, of course, our volunteers and supporters. And I think the best way to do that is to be really honest up front about our resources. But it goes back to what I said. I, if people want to run, great. But for the party, I think we need to be really careful about you know, which campaigns we put our resources behind, um, the limited resources that we have. You know, that said, I'm going to completely like, sort of change everything I mentioned the first half and tell two more stories. <laughs> so in the Green Party in Canada, a few years ago, several years ago, decided that what they wanted to do is they wanted to run a candidate in every single riding. Knowing full well that those candidates might get, you know, one, two percent, but they thought it was important to make sure that every voter in Canada had a chance to vote Green. They also were fortunate enough to have this opportunity that if the total number of votes that they get would translate into a certain amount of money that they would receive. So they decided to run candidates in every single riding, and they were able to get enough votes to get some money. And then they ran a campaign, and then they ran another campaign, and then all of a sudden they got someone elected at the national level in a first-past-the-post system, which is pretty much almost unheard of at that level. I mean, we have Greens in national parliaments all over the world, but those are in countries where they have proportional representation. And that's the idea of 5% of the vote, 5% of the seats, 10% of the vote, 10% of the seats, that you get seats in proportion to your level of support, just for those of you who may not know proportional representation. So when I first heard of it, I thought, how can anything be gained by running a bunch of 1%, 2% campaigns? I mean, I was not necessarily a huge fan of it, but they had this special opportunity where it could lead into a total number of votes that could lead into some money. But the real reason that I was, they convinced me was because they thought about it. They weren't just doing it because they were like, oh, hey, let's give every voter a chance to vote green. And so they had a clear strategy. Um, they had a goal. It was quantifiable. And so I thought that was great. And then I worked for two years with the New Zealand Parliament with the Greens, and they had done something very similar. They had passed at the national level a, a proportional voting system. and. It's a, a system called MMP, Mixed Member Proportional. Voters get two votes. You get to vote for your candidate in your district, and you get to vote what's called a party vote. The vote that really is the one that's going to get people in office is that party vote. You want to get your 5%, your 10%, whatever. So you have a whole bunch of candidates running in all these districts who are maybe getting 1% or 2%, but they're out there telling everyone to cast the party vote green. That's actually their slogan there. And so again, even though you have all these candidates who aren't doing a lot, it's party vote green. That said, they came up with criteria for what they would call a two-tick campaign. So you would want the person, you want the voter to vote for the candidate and the party. And this was because these were the ones where they wanted to focus the party resources. So in order to get the approval for a two-tick campaign, they had a whole questionnaire, series of interviews. You had to prove that you were worth those resources. It wasn't just that you asked for them and you wanted them or that you thought you were really great. You basically had to say, this is why the party should support me. It's, you know, it's pretty hardcore stuff, you know, I mean, we're Greens, we, you know, are not necessarily sitting around and uh, thinking, how are we going to have world domination? I mean, some people might be. I personally, since I like, I personally, since I'm a big fan of proportional representation, the idea for me is multi-party democracy with diverse viewpoints at the legislative table. I think that makes better public policy. So I'm all about that sort of idea. But that's not. Some other people might have a, a different philosophy. But the big thing there is, and I just wanted to mention that, you know, when you're thinking about your candidates and they come to you and say, well, you know, I expect this, this, and that, you have to be really honest about it. I mean, there's been people who have wanted to hire me and they think they're going to get a certain number of votes. And I'm just like, if you truly believe this, I am not the campaign manager for you because I don't believe it. And that could cause these resentments and tensions. Um, I think there might be several other reasons why you'd be a very good candidate, but not because not for that goal. So it is really important that people are on the same page. You had your hand raised. No, you didn't have your hand raised. No. Okay. So um, Karen and Ju uh, no, no, it's Karen and, and, and Larry. And, and Jill too. Right. So Karen. I oh, can't see Jill. Sorry. Larence and Jill. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, well, then I really hope to run. <laughs> it would be fantastic for New York City, and I'm sure we get support from you around the city. You know that. Because you've had Thank it before, you. and that's just small and small. 
but my question is one that weighs on my mind continuously, and that is how can we recruit these candidates with uh, credibility in the community? Who either have these jobs, like you said, and give them some expertise, or who have some you know, connection with a community group. I'm new in the city. I don't have deep roots. Um, some of our members do, but I, I just really think we need to identify people. We need to have a system of, of you know, approaching them, following up with them. We don't have any of that. Um, any advice? What can we do? So I think that sort of honest, realistic assessment is something we probably have to do as a party ourselves. So if there's a particular local that wants to recruit a candidate in their geographic area, that local probably needs to meet and think, okay, how many active members do we have? How much money do we think we can raise? How many volunteers do we think we can get? That way, if we are going out and talking to potential candidates, we can say, this is what we can offer you. In addition, we have expertise in X, Y, and Z because we've been doing this for years, you know, whatever it might be. Because I do think that sometimes what we underestimate is just how valuable a skill it is to understand that a third party campaign is a completely different animal from running in the two party system. But, um, so I think that realistic assessment is really important. I also think that rather than trying to say field, you know, a bunch of candidates, it might be you look at a race, whether it's your state senate, state assembly, your city council, your congress, whatever it might be, and you think the reason we want to recruit a candidate is because there's this issue or we know that this person is facing you know, a scandal. That kind of happens a lot around here. You know, or th there is an opportunity. that We feel that there is an opportunity. There's a reason to run in that district. So it's just, I, I guess for me, it's really being that kind of practical assessment and being very, very honest. Um, and then probably taking what you think you can do and subtracting 20%. <laughs> but I know Gloria has had a lot of experience in this too. We've tried it, I think. we tried to do that. I think one of the challenges, though, is you know, being a member of a community in, you know, Flushing or bed or, you know, some, some area in the Bronx, which of course I could never remember. Uh, sorry, the Bronx. <laughs> um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're integrated in, in that community. Um, and that really then becomes, uh, you may not even have the Green Party members there. So, I, you know, I think, I think that weighs heavily on us, but it's also, I, I think it's a, it's a very challenging task. Um, that really requires that it's kind of going, uh, I think, you know, going back to other kinds of political formations, uh, you know, on the left, which is you make a conscious decision or the five Green Party members in your area make a conscious decision that you are going to be uh, the activist and really an integral part of that community. And so that means you're not being you're not doing party functionary organizational things. You know, they're, 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 you know, there are old fashioned terms for this, which I won't use, but you really need to say, this is an important area. Uh, there's a lot going on. You know, there's stop and frisk in several areas around the city that are, you know, really affected. They are, you know, continually young African-American um, men being, you know, shot by the police. You know, what do we want to do in these neighborhoods? I think in our hearts, those are issues that are so important to us. And we would love to see that community activist that stood on the street and talked passionately about that horrible, you know, police shooting run for office. But in some ways, it's like I think it's similar. What Lynn says, what's realistically, how, what do we bring to that, and and how do we do that? I think it's, um, I think it's worth looking at. But I actually think it's worth looking at over a period of time to say, what are two neighborhoods? in New York City, I'll talk about New York City only because we're here and I live here, that we can start building those bridges with um, how are we going and working and offering our expertise to people's organizations in the community that in some way they may decide that we are trusted enough, never mind have the resources enough to support a candidate. So I want to just piggyback on that and then we have um, Lawrence and Jill who are on the stack. So in 2005, I ran a campaign for a woman named Robin Sklar. She ran for city council in Queens, and she ended up with was it maybe 13, 14% of the vote. But when we did the post-election analysis, precinct by precinct breakdown, there were parts of her district where she had 30, 35% of the vote, but there were also parts of her district where she had less than 1% of the vote. And by and large, that was in the New York City housing projects uh, in Queensbridge and Ravenswood. And so in 2005, I thought, 
I live in a district that has a large housing project, the Astoria Houses. And I was thinking maybe I might run in the future. And I thought, if I really want to be a credible, viable candidate, if there's any chance for me to ever win this, I'm going to have to figure out how to be relevant to voters in Astoria Houses. And I helped a community garden get started and have helped it grow from 12 members to 250 plus members. So is directly across the street from Astoria Houses. I have a number of friends in Astoria Houses. I had quite a few campaign volunteers and staff from Astoria Houses. And I did better than Robin did in um, Astoria Houses than she did in Ravenswood and Queensbridge. But my percentages there were lower than in, in the rest of the district. So there's still a lot of work to be done. That said, our best chance of maybe one day having a candidate from Astoria Houses is because I've been working really hard for years and years and years to build those bridges. So I'm thinking about running this time around, and last night I was at an event a couple blocks away from Astoria Houses, a number of my friends who live there were there, and I told them I was considering running, and they were really excited about it. But I left them with the thought, I was like, well, if I don't do it, maybe you will. Now, right now, none of them are registered green, so they probably wouldn't. But you know, one more election cycle, maybe next time they will. So there's a lot of ways to think about these things. I mean, I've been doing this since 1994. I mean, oh my god, I've been doing it almost 20 years. You know, I'm in it for the long haul. I want proportional representation and multi-party democracy. That's not a 5, 10, 15, 20 year. That's like a 40 year goal. And so, you know, yes, we want to get candidates in these districts. But I, I like what you know Gloria's talking about is maybe focusing on a couple of districts. Or what I'm saying is that sometimes you just have to do the work, and that might mean, you know, uh, someone who isn't as representative of the district starting the path, because that's really how people will then hear about the party. So I just wanted to mention it because it made me think from what Gloria was saying. Um, we had Lawrence, Jill, and then I forgot your name. The woman back there. Had her. Oh, there is. Oh, okay. Okay. So Lawrence, Jill, Ronnie. Yes. Ronnie, and then you. Okay. And then we might be out of time. So Lawrence. Uh, I gotta go. As a matter of fact, uh, Gore, you just brought up a demographic aspect of the like uh, if, if, if people of color, maybe separate from the shootings. And is, in my county, I li I'm in Hudson County, and what I've noticed um, is this, because uh, I'm also a member, so a number of you noticed now that I'm a member of NOW, National Center for Women, there's a lot of synergy between the Green Party, and now we just, just it's not established character in my county either by way of now or the Green Party. And I know that the crop the uh, it's like a one it's considered like a one party system with the Democrats. So um, it, a, a lot of the rigging in fact has to do with the tax abatements, the way they love uh, uh, it, it developers. And um, I mean uh, uh, one good campaign is the no gas pipeline. That's the equivalent of Keystone locally, because of the pipeline in my area. So several of you have heard me brought up labor issues about the minimum wage, union protection. So I'd like to get some direction as to how I can get the involvement together and the personalities to establish the chapters first, and then work on branding the candidates for office. You get, you get morale up and involvement going, and, and then we'll subsequently get, uh, Look to, look to the candidate recruitment. Well, I think it sounds like a good strategy. Absolutely, and certainly in line with what we're talking about. And, you know, you know I, I so I I got to be in touch with some of you and get support as best as I can because it's been a real struggle. I mean, morale is very low. There's a lot of distrust, mm -hmm. so it's not a lot of will to be involved. People say it's important to do it, but I don't think many people want to do it. They're too either too afraid to or too exhausted or whatever it is. I mean, there's short opportunity, there's short times to, for people to network here between workshops, but like people who are hearing hearing Lawrence on this and maybe later on, because maybe start talking informally about that. But that certainly is a good strategy. Okay. Uh, and we had Jill. Jill is Jill. next. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that so, so yeah, I just want to agree that Lawrence's idea is great about building a local based on local issues and then running a candidate and. Uh, candidates just do better where they have a local that's already going to support them. And, and for a local not to support a candidate is weird and it suggests that there's something funny going on there, like maybe there's a problem with the candidate or, or maybe the local hasn't owned up to its 
responsibility, but we are in a quarrel, and, and this is a fight, and we're not going to get change by asking for it, you know? We're gonna have to really fight for it, and the place to fight peacefully is in the, is in the voting booth. So, you know, uh, I think Lawrence's plan is a great prototype, and it would be wonderful if we had more capacity as our state parties to help new locals get formed, find that rare green who knows how to manage a campaign because there aren't very many. We need to learn, learn on the fly. So all those are really great ideas. And as we grow the party, which is what we're doing today, and today is evidence of the party's growth and expansion, as we do more of that, we become capable of doing more of these projects. And they're definitely in the pipeline, and people are talking about them. I wanted to mention one thing just by way of resource sharing, in our state of Massachusetts, we have this debate all the time about should we run, you know, in every every candidate who's willing to just do the paperwork, or should we focus? And the solution we've come up with, and I mentioned this in the last workshop too, is to encourage anybody to run, but then to create a different uh, sort of group of candidates that then become Green Party endorsed. And those are the candidates who meet the criteria, like that you were mentioning, Lynn, which are a great set of criteria. And those become where the party focuses, and they also become where we, uh, you know, we sort of create the profile of the party that we want. Because when you invite all comers to run, you know, you get a very mixed bag, and the media and the, uh, the, the predators out there will try to find the weakest candidate in the group and hold that up, you know, as the Green Party candidate. So having criteria to say these are the Green Party endorsed candidates, what does that mean? That means we have limited resources, and here's where we're going to put them. These are the candidates who really represent us. I really recommend that as a, it's one way that you can let everybody get out there and wave the flag, but you also protect yourself against quality issues and, and, and all the rest. Um, and then the other point was just, again, that uh, in my mind, when I see a candidate running who has a local who's willing to get out and do some work, that's just a really, really great sign. And, you know, it's, sign, it's a sign that the campaign is going to be a success no matter what, because it will help build the local if you've got a local that's involved with the candidate to start with. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. It just because it reminded me, as I mentioned, there's all these things I wrote down. I wanted to make sure I said them. So what Jill just said reminded me of something that, as much as I'm a big fan of targeting, um, when you're in a campaign, and I was like, oh, you could try to figure out who you're to target, who you're not going to target. The idea is you always want to run these parallel strategies. So you sort of like cast a wide net, as well as your careful targeting. Because the reality is, even though I might not think you know the woman in pearls um, is going to vote for me, it might turn out that she will. So you don't want to ignore anyone either. So to some extent, that's the exact kind of thing that we're talking about. This is a parallel strategy. While you might have a targeted strategy, you're also all embracing. So it's something that exists both in a big picture and a small picture. And then I have to say what I say at every workshop, which is that all campaigns have the same strategy at heart, which is retain your base, expand your base. So whenever anyone says, what's your campaign strategy? Retain your base, expand your base. That's it. Everything else is just details. All right? And then the last one, because I'm just going through my little tick box before I know you have a question, is um, even if maybe you think you've done the numbers and maybe you think there's no chance of you winning, let's say 50% of the vote plus one or whatever that might mean, you need to get your campaign in a position to be able to take advantage of what I guess is called like the tipping point. So one of the reasons that Audi in the example I gave in the beginning in 1999 is one of the reasons when we got down to that two-way race that she was able to win is because the Green Party of Alameda County had done the work that they were an organized, viable, credible campaign organization. So when this little narrow window of opportunity opened up, she was able to capitalize on it. When I was working on David Cobb's campaign, we were at a point that right after the 2004 election, when all the irregularities in Ohio came to light, that we had built up enough campaign organization that we were able to go and demand the recount in Ohio and coordinate 1,300 volunteers to observe the recount in 88 counties. Because, so it's important to also, no matter what your goal is, to always think about it 
what if this magic tipping point happens? That scandal I mentioned early, you know, it happens a lot in New York. You want to be able to take advantage of it. So anyway, those are just now. So Ronnie, was that your name in the back? Yes. for candidates and when I, I've run for office and made slight, slight difference for, for Lynn and I, but not that much. But I think because the Green Party program really is a social justice, it really, it is a huge program. So obviously there's a lot of pieces people can take. Sometimes that can be challenging or maybe it seems too vague. But it's what I think works for us that doesn't work for other parties. We can connect that local issue to the bigger issue. So yes, it's a real problem if there's you know kind of a waste transfer station in your neighborhood, or that you know the development is using eminent domain, but they're in your neighborhood. But you can connect that, and so I think that's what you're asking for. It's great that you're offering to kind of um, you know get more engaged in that way, and kind of do that balance. And so um, I know we're running running close to time, and we have my <coughs> Ursula, do you have your hand up? Because I know Jill does too. But no, Ursula, why do I keep thinking? So. Um, yeah, it's here, here, here. So Mike was next on the stack, yeah. Um, and you say you have involved locally, and, and I think that's good. The thing is, I think that most of you already are involved locally. I think that most of our people on the Greens are activist types by nature. Uh, and many of our people, especially in, in, in my area, are heavily involved in other organizations, leadership positions, and others. one reason we, in fact, are short on manpower to do Green Party stuff, people are so involved. But I don't think that they get identified as green. I think that we need to find a way to encourage our people when they are out doing other things to come out as green, to self-identify as green, uh, because I mean, we're, yes. we're you know, running all these organizations all over, all, all over the county, all over the city, uh, but we don't get flagged as green because we're not running for office. We're not the one running for office. You know, the person running for office might be involved in another organization, and they get flagged as green. They're better than Right. Hey, they're running for office this year. They're green. But if you're, you know, in the Peace Council or Jill Ministry or um, Act or whatever, uh, and, and you're just doing the work, and you know, you, it's the Green Party. We're the Green Party. We're the people doing the work out right. there. Most of the people that we're doing work with don't snap to the fact that, that we're green because we don't push that. Right. Right. 
And, and that, I mean, that's an excellent point. That actually should be a whole other workshop, which I would spend a lot of time talking about. But um, I, I have a lot of a lot of concerns about that and that way and the, and the energy that the Greeks put in because there's always this. You know, am I am I in the movement? And you know, we don't want to just be seen as electoral, but then we get we get our incredible skills and passion get sucked into that movement in a way that doesn't help us identify. Um, I know Jill wants to speak on, on this, but I just want to say one thing. When, when you started talking, Ronnie, about that, which I was remiss in not saying at first, is what you, kind of your vision for the Green Party, uh, which I think is a great one. But I just really want to be clear, just from my perspective, we are a political party. And so that means that we are not going to play the role of being a big a kind of NGO umbrella type thing um, only. We, as Lynn said, you know, multi-party representation, as some of us say, contest for power, fight for power. That means that we have to do those kinds of things too. And so there has to be a, you know, we have to look at that and be very, and not forget. Otherwise, what happens is what Mike is talking about. Oh, you want to okay. So just, uh, I, I can make this quick, but I, I just want to say, I think there's a win-win here. I think there's a way to bring our, political green identity to the issue work. And we actually can be an umbrella for people who are fighting for peace, justice, democracy, uh, women's rights, etc. And we make that fight green, politically green. And some of us were confronting this uh, after the election as we debated, were we going to participate in the pipeline demonstrations? Because they were telling us we couldn't speak. So if they were going to silence us, did we want to go bring our body this basically politically repressive, nonpartisan stuff. And we said, you know, our decision was, hell yes, we're not going to let them totally silence us. And what we found, we, we developed this green flag project, which I would love to tell you about, because we now have Maine, New Hampshire, yeah. uh, and I Massachusetts is all up, and New York involved too. Well, we basically, it's a strategy for visibility and recruitment. And we do both. And when we show up, we show up with flags that say vote Green Party. Not just vote Green, but vote Green Party. And we found that when we went to distribute these at the Pipeline Parade in Portland, Maine, everybody sucked them up. It's like they wouldn't let us speak officially from the stage, but everybody on the ground wanted to be carrying a Green Party flag. So we realized we need to come to these things with hundreds or thousands of flags and show how green the movement is in the street, politically green. And we decided it's not just a flag that says vote green, because there are all kinds of ways that that can be co-opted, but it's a flag that says vote green party. And we don't stop with the visibility, we also go there with something to sign, so that it's also a recruitment event. It's a fun thing, it's a celebration in the way that all these rallies and stuff can be with posters and costumes and all that. It's a lot of fun, and there are a lot of people will join the party just because they could come out and go to a demo again and have a good time. But we also come with uh, petitions. So in the case of Maine, in Portland, Maine, the uh, Mainers, the, the Maine Greens came with a petition getting people to sign up for to fight the pipeline. And that gave them then a list where they could actually work after the it, after the demo, it wasn't all over. You know, the press can boycott it, and then it's as if it didn't happen. They come away with a list, and then they can move and grow the group. Um, in uh, for the Washington demo, we created this voter climate voter power pledge, and what it says was, "I promise that I will not vote for any candidate who supports an all of the above strategy." If you go to these things, go to these things, and you say, "Would you please sign up for the Green Party?" Not everybody's quite ready to do that, but they are ready to say, I've had it with people who support all of the above climate change policy. Oh. So at any rate, there's a way we can do this, we can put a green brand on these events because, as you say, we are the ones who are doing the work. We really are the engines of this social movement. It's time to show our colors and to use these events to actually grow the party, not allow them to suppress us. Thank, thanks, Jill. And I think we're at we're just about out of time, but I think well, Lynn, I know you're in the middle of looking back. Yeah, no, just, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I just unfortunately I have a flight to catch, so I was like, Jill, if you could let me finish, that would be great. Because I know you also have, I believe, a keynote coming up. Yeah, right? we do. We yeah, do. great. Okay.
So, and I, I um, so what I wanted to say, and a few of these things pipe in, which is, you know, being seen, being green is a big issue. Gloria and I happen to be wearing green colors, Lauren's wearing buttons. You know, every single day, there's, you know, other people wearing green. Every single day, I try to, in some way, leave my house and think, how am I identifying myself as a green? I have people who see me and they're like, oh yeah, that's right, you're the green lady. I mean, we have a brand, we might as well take advantage of it. There you go, you're wearing green. Um, that's number one. Number two, you know, when you run for office, you're on the ballot, that gives you a great platform. It's not, you may not be invited to the debate, but voters are gonna pay a lot more attention to you because you're a candidate than they would if you're just a community activist. So one way to, you know, to make sure you have a platform is to run. <coughs> Another one is that, yes, we're Greens, most of us, and we're an electoral organization, but that doesn't just mean candidate campaigns. So I've mentioned again and again and again, there are initiative and referendum processes. Here in New York City, we have one. I'm not as familiar with the laws in, in New Jersey or Connecticut or Philadelphia, but there are a lot of states around this country and a lot of cities that have an initiative and reform process. So when you're at a rally, it is great to be able to get people to sign up for a petition, but it's, you know, if you're gonna have them sign up for a petition, might as well have them sign up for a petition to get an issue on the ballot so that then people can vote for it. Because as much as you can talk about things like instant runoff voting or, or single transferable vote, until it's on the ballot and people have to decide whether they're voting yes or no, they're not really gonna pay attention. So there's just a lot of ways to think about this. You know, obviously, you know, everyone decides what level of support they can do. The, the one point I do wanna make is that not everyone can give everything all the time. So that whole idea of sustainability of our activism is very important. Running campaigns, Volunteering on campaigns and being a candidate is very labor intensive. And often, those candidates are burnt out. The fact that Jill is still going around <laughs> is amazing and really impressive. I'm, you know, <laughs> I know I, I was burnt out after my race. Um, you know, Gloria's run multiple times. You know, it's okay to step back, maybe get back active in your local community organization, and, but then just make sure that your, your scene is green so that in two, three, five years when you decide maybe that you want to run for office, that they know you're green, and then again, now you've given a reason for them to vote for you. So what I hope is that everyone here maybe, if not learn something, maybe they, they're gonna think about it in a slightly different way. I have my opinions, they're based on my experience. I think I'm right, but you know. <laughs> Mostly what I like to do is have people just think about it differently. Because a lot of the stuff about being active in rallies and being active in local organizations and being seen, being green. This was stuff we talked about in 1994. You know, I'm almost at 20 years now. And unfortunately, while we've had some good successes, we haven't had as many as I'd like. But the positive note is that I do feel that we're back on an upswing, which is I know what Ben mentioned earlier today. And so the thing there is that how do we capitalize on it? Again, if we're at that, you know, tipping point, what do we do to make sure that it doesn't disappear on us? because you know, people on the planet are of course you know, waiting for us to make the difference. So thank you very much right, for your time. You for being here. And I <laughs>